I would invite you, if you are able, to grab your Bible, turn on your phones, put on a silencer, by the way. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. We will begin reading in verse 19. So as you turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews, of course, is in the New Testament. So it's the back. As I reflected on what message to bring today ahead of our transformation conversation. I don't say this often out loud for lack of being branded a cook. But I just flat out ask God, God, what, <laughs> what message should I, should I bring to your people? And then for once, I became quiet <laughs> and just listened. What, you know, what, what? And I just sat. And what I heard startled me a little. So I wrote it down and put a question mark at the back of it. I was like, well, I needed to test it out. Is this, is this true? And I looked at our mission statement again. Love God, know Christ, care for one another, joyfully share the good news of Jesus Christ. It seems to me that what I heard as I reflected and waited was that it all begins with worship. <laughs> it all begins with worship. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. As it were, a call to worship, an invitation to worship, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his own flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith and with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. Let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. It all begins with worship. Someone came to Jesus one time and asked him, so tell me what it all boils down to. I mean, if you were to stand on your feet and tell us in a few sentences all these laws, all these prophets, all the things that we hear about, the interpretation, it goes on and on. Give me a quick summary. And what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and the greatest commandment, he said. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And these two commandments, plus the great commission, go into the world, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have taught you, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. 
These are the ideas behind our mission statement. It all begins with worship. Jesus said, worship the Lord your God with all your heart. And in the West, when we talk about heart, we think of emotion. We think of feeling. But the Hebrew thought of heart was much bigger than just emotions and feeling. Not that that's not important. It is very important. But the heart was the center of the person. The seat of decisions. This is where decisions were made. Your motives came from your heart. This is your very being. So what Jesus is saying is love the Lord your God with your very being. With your all. And your neighbor as yourself. In the letter to the Hebrews, we are invited <laughs> to enter into the sanctuary and reasons are given for this invitation. The reason is that we have confidence to enter the sanctuary because of the blood of Christ by the new and living way that is through his, the curtain that was torn from top to bottom, his own flesh, that's his suffering on the cross. Some of you remember that when Jesus died, there was an earthquake according to the Gospel of Matthew, and the curtain which divides the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was ripped in half, literally from top to bottom. As it were, the way is open. Right? It used to be that only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and only once a year. Now, in the death of Jesus, that's what Hebrews is referring to. Open. So we are invited to come in and says, verse, verse 32, let us approach with a true heart. With a true heart. Can I ask, where is your heart? today. Jesus looked around at the crowd and the people that were around him. And John tells us that sometimes he, <laughs> he did not yield himself to them because he knew their heart. Where is my heart today? The seat of my being, the core of my person. Is that what I bring to worship? Or is that checked at the door for the more practical affairs of Monday through Friday? Worship the Lord your God with all your heart. So we are to come with a true heart. We are also to come in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. What in the world does that mean? How does one conjure up a sense of faith? Well, you can't conjure it up. An assurance in a, is an inner witness, something based from within. And as far as I can figure, it comes from a reflection focused time on the work of Christ and what he has done for us, what he has done on the cross, the assurance of faith. That is part of how we come. Then it says, come with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Still on verse 22. That's all I'm going to do today, verse 22. Our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Is there anybody here who does not have regrets in your life? Anybody here who wishes they may have done something different sometime? Yes. And as I suggested last week, instead of being weighted down and carrying this guilt around, he says, come with your hearts sprinkled clean. That's why we take time to confess when we come to pray, when we come to worship together. Almost like a reset button, a reminder of who we are and who we are. Come with your hearts sprinkled clean. 
from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. This is a reference, of course, to baptism. Now, I know that towards the end of this passage in verse 25, it talks about the need to encourage one another <laughs> unto good deeds, deeds of love. It talks about the need not to neglect to meet together, to worship. And yet, I ask myself, well, what was going on in those days that people didn't meet together to worship? Were they lazy? Well, no, it turns out they weren't lazy. They had a lot of things going on. Well, what was it? Were they burdened with too many blessings? That wasn't it. That wasn't it. They, they had a lot of blessings, but that wasn't why they did not go to worship some of them. I was shocked. You know why they didn't go, some of them? Persecution. Persecution. It was no longer cool or popular to be a believer. And all of a sudden it became safer to be my own private individual believer over here. And the book of Hebrews says, even on account of persecution, do not give up or neglect the habit of meeting together. It's amazing. I think we have misunderstood what it means to be the body of Christ. Can I say this out loud and plain? You cannot be a Christian all by yourself. The whole thing is set up so that we may constitute together the body of Christ. Now, of course, there are brothers and sisters who are in nursing homes, who are frail, who are not able to move, and we, we are supposed to pay attention to how we extend to them the benefits of being part of the body of Christ. Not neglecting them, pay attention. Take communion to them, go visit them, send them a card. There is a card shower going on for Mr. Rakey here tomorrow, if you haven't heard. But the idea of the church, we talk about the church, everybody knows the church is not the building, the church is what? Separate and alone in their own homes? No. No. So Hebrew says, even in the face of persecution, we are called to gather together. Why? Why is that so important? It's important because this life is not a life you can live by yourself. I cannot live by myself. We need each other's prayer. We need each other's encouragement. In study. In prayer. In support. When we also come together, we provide a united witness against all that is against who God is and what God wants to do. Throughout history, whatever the church has done, it has done as a united body. It's never been really just one person doing what they want to do. So when I heard that this week, it all begins with worship, I asked myself, so what? So my invitation to you is to ask yourself again and to consider again where your heart is when it comes to worship. Where is your heart when it comes to worship? Is worship something we do if we get around to it, if it fits in our schedule on a particular weekend? Is that our attitude towards worship? 
If that is our attitude towards worship, it falls far less, far less from where God wants us to be. Let us pray. Father, it all begins with worship. We pray that you forgive us where we have fallen short, where our attitude has been that pretty much on my own, I just care for myself and let everybody else care for themselves. We pray that you forgive us. We pray, Lord, that you strengthen us because we cannot drum up faith on our own. And as we get ready today for our transformation conversation, begin with our own hearts, O oh God. Begin with our own hearts in terms of where we are in our worship of you. We need your spirit because we are not able on our own. Bring us to a place of deep honesty with you. Because then you can finally get to those hidden places and do your great work there. We thank you. And we ask all this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.